Thank you all for joining us for this session, part two of two on strategies for success, project management for libraries. This is a great topic that has so many applications and helpful for people at all stages of their career. So it can be relevant to so many aspects of our work. And I appreciate having you all here today to look at how we can grow these skills together. So my name is Kendra Morgan, and I'm a senior program manager on the Web Junction team, which is part of OCLC. And I'm going to share more about my organization and what we do in a few minutes to provide more context. And project management is a skill set that's it's core to a lot of my work that supports libraries. And I also get to see library staff develop and use project management skills when they work with us on various projects. So today we're going to be looking at several aspects of project management that can help you be successful in your work, such as starting strong, monitoring your progress throughout the project, and how communication can be addressed at all stages. So I want to give some insight into the project management activity and my work and why I've sought to develop these skills. So Web Junction offers professional development and continuing education opportunities for library staff and volunteers at any stage of their career or in any library position. And we've been doing this for close to 20 years. And a key part of that is that everything that we offer through our site is free. And this is often made possible because of grant funds, along with support from state libraries, including the New York State Library, as well as our organization, OCLC. So the Web Junction team designs and leads training initiatives to spread innovative practices across libraries. And we do this through partnerships with funders, library associations, state libraries, iSchools, people who are training future librarians and other nonprofit organizations. And these initiatives are essentially projects. And my job is to shepherd these opportunities through their life cycle so that we can continue to make resources available to library staff. So everything at Web Junction that we create is available through our online learning portal. It's webjunction.org. And I encourage you to explore the website and the resources so you can learn more about our work and how it can support you in your library. You'll find an entire section about our projects and work that we've done. And these are just a few of the topics and projects that we've engaged in over the last 20 years. And they include a wide range of activities on library related topics, which are timely and connected to the needs of library staff. And on these projects, I've played a variety of roles. So from monitoring the budget, and that was it, like I was just responsible for checking on the budget, supporting the project manager in that instance, to being a team member who was helping to deliver on some of the goals that we had all the way through to being the project manager, right? Essentially responsible for the successful delivery of the project activities. In addition to these topics, we've also done projects on Spanish language outreach, uh, library advocacy, Wikipedia, transforming library spaces, and story time. So Supercharged Story Times was a huge project that we did several years ago. Basically, anything that comes up for library staff is something that we are willing to explore and do a project on. And we just look for the right opportunities and the right time to develop these projects. So some of the projects also have opportunities for libraries to manage their own mini projects within our bigger project. So for example, on the Transforming Library Spaces project, we provided grants to libraries to develop a plan to transform their spaces. And that included having to conduct a needs assessment with their community, building out a budget, implementing their own programs. And our job was to help support the library staff throughout the project with any aspect of their planning. So we have really served in a mentor role to help people think about these processes. So most of the content that we make available as a result of these projects are freely available. Many of these things are an output from the projects that we've been running. And they are part of our project plans and our strategy to get resources into the hands of library staff. And these resources include free webinars every month, articles on library related topics connected to the project, but it also includes bigger things such as self paced courses, which is actually one of the largest parts of our work, um, developing self paced training for library staff and you'll find over 300 self paced courses and webinars in our online course catalog and 
I noted that these types of activities, webinars, communications through webinars, such as newsletters, social media, self-paced courses, these are often part of our detailed project plans and have a lot of moving parts. They include a lot of the components of project management that we'll be discussing today. So now that you know a little bit about the perspective that I'm bringing to this, let's clarify what we mean when we call something a project. So this is the definition from the Project Management Institute, which actually certifies people in project management. And the definition is a temporary effort to create value through a unique product, service, or result. It's important to note the use of the word temporary here. Projects really should have a defined beginning and end. And sometimes those ends can be just weeks away. And other times we're talking about years, but they do end. And you know that at the beginning. So there are individuals who are hired at companies to serve just as project managers, and they may work on a single project for years, or they launch and complete a project in a few months, and then they move on to the next thing, but at the same organization. A project management professional, the acronym PMP, it's a thing. So it's someone who's received a certification in project management that Project Management Institute offers this type of certification. Most of us don't need this certification, but it's a thing and it's a huge professional field. No one on my team, our staff, has their PMP, but we use project management skills in many aspects of our work. And most commonly, it's when we've received grant funding or a contract with a partner to complete a project. In my experience, people in libraries who are managing a project are often doing it as part of their regular jobs, not in a role as a designated project manager, which is fine. It's completely common. It's really part of my work too. I'm not always managing a project. I have a bunch of core continuing activities that are part of my job that aren't really project related. The great part about project management is that the skills are really transferable and help us out in so many aspects of our work. And so I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about what a project in a library can look like. So we're going to use the chat function for this, and I want to see what comes to mind for all of you when you think about a library project. And in the chat, I'd just like you to share a project that your library has worked on. It doesn't need to be something that you were involved in. Just think about a project and you can tap that in. So I can share like one example, right, is getting new shelving. It's not just what the patrons see, right, where one day there were suddenly new shelves. On the back side, there was an evaluation of the need, how much shelf space you needed to have in the library, a review of vendors, materials and pricing, approving of a budget, often some weeding of the collection, which is my personal favorite part, purchasing materials, installation, transfer of the old to the new, and then removal of the old, right? So some of the things that I'm seeing shared are the development of a new branch, huge project, right? That's a multi-year project from conception to acquiring the land, finding a contractor, implementing RFID. That's a perfect example, right? You have to think about the technology that's coming in, all the books that need to be handled, how that's going to happen, creating um, a full inventory of the collection. Absolutely, that's a project, right? And it can have a defined beginning and end. Other things that people may have done, um, implementing a new ILS, integrated library system, so those construction projects, an upgrade to a computer lab is another great one. So you've already shared some great examples that have been happening in your libraries, and there's a lot to be learned from all of these projects. So let's talk about starting strong. So the thing I love about a new project is the opportunity for a fresh start. And it always feels so promising to me. It's kind of like the first day of school. There's lots of good energy. You have the opportunity to start strong and set the tone for your project. We're going to start by looking at what's in your project plan. And so today we're focusing on the importance of managing a project and keeping on track. And that really includes an assumption that you actually have a project plan. So we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but I do want to touch on the idea that a strong project start 
includes reviewing the project plan and understanding what needs to happen and when. One way that you can do this is to start thinking about goals, right? So people create SMART goals, um, which stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. And as you review the project plan, you want to look to see if these details are included and where you need to add clarity. So I really like to think about the project plan as a map but it may not be the detailed turn-by-turn -turn directions. So that level of specificity just isn't possible. And really it's much better to have some flexibility in your plans because as we'll talk about later, things will change and the ability to shift and adjust to changing conditions is important. And you want to be able to use your experience and judgment with decisions as they unfold. So let's walk a little bit through the acronym and this acronym is very familiar with people setting professional development goals or individual goals for all kinds of reasons. And you'll find lots of documentation online about it. So the specific is it's important to know what you're doing because sometimes the how is what's going to remain flexible, but you want to be clear about what you're trying to accomplish. The measurable allows us to know what we are moving towards and what we want to be able to evaluate. Achievable means that it's realistic. Can you do this with the constraints in place? And those constraints are almost always time, scope, and cost. And then finally, we've got relevant, which is understanding if the proposed work is necessary to complete the project. And then time bound is when does that goal need to be completed? So as you review the plan, you want to note the areas that require clarity, where you have questions, what follow-up you need to take and with whom. This step of reviewing the goals and reviewing the plan can be for anyone involved in the project. Asking to see the project plan or any documentation that exists about the work is one way to proactively learn more. I will acknowledge that this can sometimes cause a little bit of tension depending on your personal relationship with the project manager. So approach us with an open mind. Um, questions like, is there a project plan or any documentation I can read to familiarize myself with the work? It's worth checking in, but also consider how the request is going to be received and how you frame the ask. You want to set the tone as being open and wanting to learn more instead of it sounding um, critical or skeptical. And it's possible that the plan doesn't exist yet. So we need to be helping people navigate through that as well and if they need help developing the plan. The next important aspect of a strong start is knowing who needs to be involved. Then you can bring them all together or ask to bring them together. So my team usually calls this a kickoff meeting and it doesn't matter how small of a role someone might play in the overall work. If you can bring them to the table for the kickoff, it has a couple of advantages. One is that allows you to all start building a common language around the project. This could be the acronyms that you start using, the partners that you're working with. It allows you to all build that familiarity. The second is that it gives everyone a chance to hear the information about the project goals, the timeline, who is doing what. And then it allows people to start exploring the questions there are about the project, because there will definitely be questions. A kickoff is a great idea, but what if there isn't anybody else? <laughs> so let's face it, I know plenty of very small libraries where it's a single person running the show. And there is no one else working on the team. And in this case, a kickoff still works. And that's really just setting aside the time to review the project plan or start one if it doesn't exist walk through the timeline, the budget, the goals, anything that might be relevant. The kickoff is also a chance to explore the unknowns of the project and see where the project plan might need more detail. If you are in a room with other people, encourage them to ask questions. I think one of the challenges that can come with this is that you might need to put things in a parking lot, the idea that you're capturing an idea for the future, but you don't know the answer yet but documenting that that question or concern has been raised and still needs to be addressed 
I think it's a professional courtesy and it's building respect and trust to tell people that you hear their questions and while you're not ready to answer it yet, you'll be putting it uh, to the side and you'll come back to it when you have some more information. If you do that, it really is incumbent on you to then follow up with that individual. So respect their time and their contributions. And when you ask them for their questions and engagement that you come back and revisit that. So some of my projects can be pretty big and I have stakeholders who include my boss and peer managers and staff who I will need to support the project. And lots of my work also includes engagement with external partners uh, from other organizations, as well as contractors that we hire to support the project. And whether or not these people need to be at the kickoff is really up to you. They may not even be hired yet. So consider when it would be most helpful and let them know so they understand that the work is underway and they can expect to hear from you in the future. We sometimes have that, you know, like if we're going to do some marketing and it's going to be four or five months down the road before we even start doing that planning. Sometimes we don't let those folks know, but we do let them know that the project has started and that we'll be following up with them. So it's on their radar. And when we reach out again, it's not the first time they're hearing about it. So if you do bring new people onto the project team after it starts, think about the transfer of knowledge that they will need to have a strong start, right? So spending time helping to onboard them to the project and what has been accomplished to date and where things are in the process, letting them know the other members of the project team, who they can turn to for help and support. Communication comes into play throughout any project. It's kind of core to all of our work. And from the initial kickoff meeting through to the final deliverable, communication needs to be part of the process. And at the beginning of the project, it's a great opportunity to set the tone for the style that can carry throughout the project. So think about the types of tools you want to have in place to manage the project. Is it face-to-face -face meetings, online meetings, phone call check-ins with stakeholders? It's really an opportunity to ask people how they like to work too, asking what they will need to be successful. How often do you need to hold meetings? Talking through this at the start, I think is really important, but it's also a strategy to implement later in a project if things are getting off track or there's more work to be done. You may need to schedule more meetings and more frequent check-ins depending on how things are evolving. So be willing to be adaptable and flexible. So you all chose to be here today. The topic interests you in some way, which is great. I'm glad to be here because I really enjoy this and I enjoy this aspect of my work. But the reality is that sometimes we find ourselves in charge of a project or working on something that we aren't super excited about. Or you're working with someone who is expressing frustration about the scope of work or their contributions. This could also be a change that happens later in the project because sometimes things get harder and not easier. Um, frustration and dissatisfaction is absolutely part of our work lives. The best case scenario is that something that we can work through, right? But a lot of challenges surface because of bad communication or misaligned expectations. And as a project manager, you have the opportunity to set the tone for how the project will go. So think about what you can do for others on the team and really what you can do for yourself to make the work more enjoyable or satisfying. It's worth considering how attitudes work into your plans for the project and how you might need to adapt communication and manage it to meet the styles of the other people that you're working with. The last piece of starting strong that I'd like to talk about is knowing where you're going. And the idea of the work being measurable is one of the key components of SMART, that SMART acronym that we started with. And one of the strongest ways to start is to be clear about where you need to end up. What will you be measuring? And remember that projects have an end date. So when you reach that end date, what are you expecting to see? So if you have a small project, you have something that will take years, something that will take years are going to have lots of milestones along the way, which are really important to measure even then, right? Have you hit the milestones that you intended? 
with the grant funded projects that I work on, this is often addressed in our grant proposals. So we've defined a set of activities and identified outcomes. So I can see where the project needs to go. And if we go back to that original definition of our project, which is to create value through a unique product, service, or result, what value are you trying to create? And how will you know if you're successful? So helping everyone on your team or your stakeholders see where you're heading is really important so that you work toward the same goal. It also helps to minimize something called scope creep, which is when you go beyond what you need to do to successfully deliver on the project. And I don't, it's not to say that going above and beyond is bad, but with the constraints that are in place, is it necessary? And can you come back to it later? I think it's another good place for parking lot of ideas and possibilities is can you just do the first hurdle that's required and then come back to something. It could be a great idea and it could add a lot of value, but if it's going beyond the value that you stated in your project plan as part of the deliverable project, think about whether or not it's the right time to do it. Small additions probably aren't going to add a tremendous amount of time to the budget or costs. So it may be a decision that you choose to make track that because if you chose to deviate even a little bit, it would be helpful to know why, especially if it added value. Another activity is to look at any required documentation that may need to be submitted when the project is done. And this is often the case with grant funded projects where the funder has a specific form that grantees need to complete. And those forms help the funder track their investments and have all the grantees providing the same style of information. Budget tracking is another one to check out at the beginning. What will you need to be able to show and document at the end? For my team, this includes staff time, any supplies and materials, payments to consultants, I track all of those things and items separately to report both internally for any audits that we have and externally to our stakeholders when necessary. And what we try to do at the beginning of every project is to look at these documents and look at the if there's an interim report that's required, what are we going to need so that when that reporting period comes around, we're not trying to find documentation that we don't have. Ideally, when it comes to reporting, it's going to be a, a matter of pulling on existing materials, and it can just be made a lot simpler if you know what those requirements are going to be at the outset. So those are some tips I have for getting started successfully. So let's transition to talking about ongoing management of the project, because you'll need to monitor the progress of the work in order to stay on track. How you do this monitoring progress is really flexible and there are lots of tools available. I don't use them. <laughs> I use a Word document and I use Excel spreadsheets. Those are my two best friends. Um, there are some fantastic project management tools. Microsoft actually has a tool called Microsoft Project that allows you to create detailed Gantt charts which lay out the timeline for all of the activities. These are great tools. They're really handy. I think the more complex your project is, the more helpful that they can be. I've just found for the scope of what I do, a Word document, and I often have the original project plan, and then I add my notes right into the project plan so I can keep track of where things are, where they are laid out. And then I have an Excel spreadsheet that shows all of the timelines. So every month of the project is laid out and I just color in those cells and I keep it really simple. That time bound aspect of our work, right? All of our deliverables, our activities should be tied to a timeline. So when does it need to be delivered? When do you need to get it out there? Timeline shift, that's not a problem, right? In the most case, we can adapt to that. Just keep track of it. And are there any dependencies that might be impacted by that? So keep an eye on that type of thing. And if you're stacking up requirements, so if you need to be able to have A completed before you move on to B, that's important to note. 
reaching milestones. I'm big about celebrating. I like to congratulate my team when we've hit a milestone. I like to be sometimes be able to tell our funder when we've hit a milestone. I find those things really important and helpful to build momentum. I do lots of individual check-ins with my team as part of their work and find out what kinds of support they need. That's one of the biggest questions that I like to ask folks during discussions is, do you have what you need to be able to do X, Y, Z? Like what's missing? And then being prepared for those mid-course corrections. Something might change and you just need to know the scope and how much that might impact you. So most projects come with some kind of budget, which can include staff time, materials, supplies, software, hardware. And ideally, most of this has been thought out before the start. But even if it has, I can guarantee you two things. Something that should have been included in the budget probably wasn't. (laughs) And two, some part of the budget is going to change. Staff time for us is usually the biggest expense. And one thing that I'm always really cautious of is people not associating a cost to staff time. It is true that if we have full-time staff working in our organizations, that they are resources that we can use. But these resources often have capacity issues, right? We've got a lot on our plates. So While you may have access to that individual, do they have the capacity to do the work in addition to what they already have on their plates? Do you need to help them prioritize to take some things away? Um, That's really hard, I find, for library staff is choosing to let certain things go because we grow attached, right? We grow attached to programs and activities and providing really quality services. So making those decisions isn't always easy, but you really need to know what's on the plate and consider that as part of your budget. And do you actually have those resources available to you? I mentioned that I am a big fan of Excel spreadsheets, and that's my go-to for tracking budgets as well. It's not particularly fancy, but it does everything that I need. I look at expenses monthly to confirm they are valid. And then because most of my projects run over a year or several years, I do a quarterly review of all the expenses and the overall budget to see where things are. And I have a column for the budgeted amount, the actual amount spent and the remaining budget. And for staff time, I do a forecast to try and figure out if we've budgeted enough time for the staff. Do we have the resources that we need going forward so that we can make sure we can maintain that level of effort? So part of monitoring progress is accepting change. I'm good with change. I like it. I'm pretty good with mid-course corrections. I don't mind a softball in the middle of my day that has me pivot. Not everyone's comfortable with it. I think the bigger the change, sometimes the more struggles we have. The thing that I always say to my team when it comes to having to change something that is in the project plan or budget is assume that the answer is yes. If there's something that needs to change to make the project successful, we need to consider it. But the key there is that the question needs to be asked. Someone needs to surface the concern and the possibility. So if I'm just monitoring the budget, for example, and the project team is meeting and they say, we didn't realize we were going to need X and that's not in the budget, I guess we don't get X. What I need them to do is come to me and say, we have uncovered a new need. This is why we think we need it. Is there room in the budget to make this change? And then I can look at the budget. I can look at other constraints and figure out if it's something we can do. Sometimes that includes getting approval from another manager. But the bottom line is you have to get the conversation going. And it's better to get it going sooner, especially when you have a good reason, right? We aren't perfect. There's something that is going to get by us, but let's talk about what that change needs to be and how we can do it to make sure that we meet the expectations on the project. So be prepared to explain why the change needs to happen. Do you need more time? That happens a lot, right? I need two more months. We're not done. Do you need more money? Are the targets or goals you expected from the project not being met? 
And I can say like a really clear example of a time when project goals weren't being met was at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, right? People had deep plans, middle of huge projects, and suddenly you had to hit the brakes. Everything changed but everyone also understood that everything was changing, right? So we had to think about how do we pivot? How do we change our approach? Is this still the right thing to do? We had a lot of in-person events planned that we had to pivot and go online. There's still a lot of costs with offering an online session. So it's not that it becomes free and you have to change all your plans. So I think what's important there is to document those types of changes too, because it helps with not only addressing your current need, but it helps with the next time something comes along, right? You're like, oh, there's also this possibility that we might be able to revisit, which we've done in the past. I think when we've underestimated the time and resources needed is another thing to really consider is that, you know, can we get better at estimating the level of effort that's required? So talking about challenges and concerns early is always a good idea. No one likes to be surprised. Keep notes and document those changes. Another change that is not uncommon is staff turnover, people leaving in the beginning, middle, and end of projects. I've had it happen every single way possible. Depending on their role, it can be really impactful. So think about how to document throughout the project so that transitions can be easier, that you have the information for future planning. Losing that project knowledge isn't easy, and documentation can rarely cover all that will be lost, but it can help with as much detail as possible. So be prepared from that change at the beginning. Assume it's going to happen and the impact that it can have on the project. I want to end this section by talking about the importance of supporting a project team. So most times we don't do things solo, independently, in a vacuum, and a lot of benefit can come from different perspectives on a project. It helps us to consider different solutions, maybe see biases in our work, and it can really strengthen the project. This doesn't matter if you are the project manager or a contributor on the product. Letting people know that they are appreciated and are bringing value to a project is important. And this includes both private and public acknowledgement. Meetings are a great place to comment on positive progress and a job well done, but think about other opportunities as well. My message here is to really be the kind of person that other people want to work with. Acknowledge it when they've made a good contribution. Make sure you're calling out people for what they are bringing to the table and the value that you see in them because it really goes a long way. So we are getting close to wrapping up this webinar and I wanna talk about what it looks like to wrap up a project. So reporting. This may not come up depending on the project, but a report may be necessary and some kind of acknowledgement of the end is just healthy and helpful. <laughs> so one way that you can do this is through an after action review. And this is a process that you can do at the end of a project or throughout the project after specific parts or activities are completed. It's one way to look at how an action unfolded and how it went. So my team recently conducted an after action review after hosting a large online event, which was part of a much more complex project plan. We looked at how the process went, what we liked, what could be improved, and how it contributes to the overall success of the project. So an after action review, I think sometimes people have called it um, a debrief session. It's not It'd be like that. Postmortem is another way to describe it. After action review just kind of has a much nicer ring to it. So what you want is to encourage participants to share their experience from their perspective. So you want to focus on why things happened. You want to compare the intended results with what was actually accomplished. So if you wanted 200 people to attend the event, but 175 attend, you could focus on some of the challenges that people shared in being able to attend that day. Were there travel concerns? Um, did they have another priority? 
but how close were you to meeting your intended results? It encourages participation. Remember, I mentioned that we don't always see things the same, and that's important. We don't want everyone to think the same way. We want them to bring their unique experiences to a project and to the execution. It makes things so much stronger. You are going to get people who are bringing experience that they had from an event that was really positive that's going to improve your event or your project. Like I had the chance to do this at my last library. Here's what we learned there. So you want people to participate. You want to have those voices heard and for them to walk away feeling like they contributed. And part of that is emphasizing trust and the value of feedback. I think in similar to what I was mentioning earlier in recognizing people's contribution, an after action review is really a chance for people to, to be able to share their perspective of how things unfolded, where you think you can improve and how we can strengthen our roles together. Going back to documentation, uh, think about what you can keep or record that would be helpful for future projects. What will your future self thank you for? I gave the example at the beginning of uh, replacing library shelving as a project. So how did things go with the vendor? Did you like their materials? Would you use them again? Would you suggest them in the future for similar activities? Did you need more resources than you had? Was the staff allocation enough? Was the budget enough? What have you learned, right? How can you take that forward? And the one thing I would encourage you to do is do it while things are fresh. Don't wait months. This doesn't have to be long, but it really can pay off in the future. It's just tidy too, right? Like put a bow on it, put it on the shelf. Thank you very much for your service. And you can go on to the next project, but then you can revisit what you learned in this one and come back and benefit from that knowledge. So looking back at what you've learned in a project is important, and we want to be able to take those lessons to improve on our next project and activities, and we want to build on success and learn from the past. And since my work is so fo focused on learning, I wanted to ask you to think about one area of project management that you can focus on in the next three months. So we've talked about planning, having smart goals, communication, budgeting, managing change, acknowledging contributions, and documenting progress. So if you can use the chat and just put in one of the things that you think can help you, I think it's really important that, you know, like a webinar, right, coming for one hour is a great way to spark ideas. It is up to you to then take those ideas and put them into action. What you do next can be really small in scope, your own mini project, right? So take one idea and tug on it a little bit, play with it. So documentation is coming up as one of the things people want to work on. That's a good one because we've all got something going on that needs to be documented. Planning in advance, right? Looking ahead and saying, how can I lay out what this next section of a project is going to look like? change management. So we talked about some of the things that come into play with change. I love it. Like I, I think I almost thrive on change and the opportunity to try something new. So there's a lot of resources available that can help with that. I like Christina's suggestion of documentation and follow up with documentation, right? Because it's kind of a never ending process. All right, this is good. I appreciate you sharing some of that and I hope it serves as a little bit of a reminder as you go through to revisit these things because we have to flex them, right? It's a muscle that we need to learn to grow. So real quickly, just a couple of resources. One of the best things about project management is that it is a universal approach that has place in libraries, but isn't specific to them, right? There are tons of free self-paced learning out there that you can benefit from. Coursera has free courses, edX, if your library subscribes to LinkedIn Learning. These are all options where you can take free weeks long classes in project management, and they really are applicable to libraries. If you do this approach, you can always go at it by yourself. Like that's good self paced learning or find a buddy. I do much better with a little bit of accountability. So I like to have somebody going through things just to talk about them. 
check out the offerings from these organizations to see if there are things that you could take advantage of. And really remember that this is work that can benefit libraries. Our projects have huge impact in adding value to our communities. So think about how you can apply them and help to strengthen what's available to your community through your projects. All right. So I'm going to stop there and you're welcome to reach out to me directly. I've shared my email address. I'd be interested to hear what questions you all have. All right. Thanks.